Thanks very much, Catherine. And I just want to thank Bernard. Um, I was very lucky uh, when I started this project to have Bernard's help. Um, I'm not a historian, but I'm really interested in history. Uh, and I was absolutely delighted to have the opportunity uh, to make this commemorative film. Um, so I guess I just want to explain, first of all, um, in, in terms of as a filmmaker, um, so the key to, to telling a story is obviously uh, the, visual, the visualization um, of it. And um, so when something happened in 1922, there is film footage uh, from around that era in Dublin, uh, but there's obviously none of the funeral. And, uh, and, and then there are a couple of pictures from outside the pro-cathedral uh, of the civic guards marching for the first time and of the members of the doll. Uh, and then this picture, and, and as a photographer and a filmmaker, um, you know, a picture can tell a thousand words. Um, that's that's uh, what's often said. And in some cases, a picture can tell a lot more than that. And in this case, it can tell more than words can say. So this was my starting point. Uh, and, and out from this, I thought I could extrapolate the story. Um, so from that point onwards, um, the first few weeks I spent uh, digesting all the material uh, which became this exhibition uh, and from that I wrote a short script uh, or rather a long script which became my final script and um, thereafter um, I had to really find kind of a method of, of uncovering the story and and how I did that was again uh, I visited the, the cemetery at Kailossary Cemetery at Rolston uh, with Bernard and I figured that that would be the best thing would be that would be a starting point to go and, and at least try to film something there. Um, as a filmmaker, again, um, some of you may know that uh, there's a thing called the magic hour, which happens uh, at the beginning and at the end of every day, sunrise and sunset. Uh, so I went there at sun, uh, sunset one evening uh, to discover that the, the sun didn't hit the gravestones at all. Uh, and then I went back the following morning and, and was very happy to see that it did. Uh, so my methodology in terms of, of how to gather the material was uh, for the month of March this year, um, I went to this graveyard at Rollstown um, every morning. And, uh, and again, in a meteorological sort of aside, um, out of the 31 mornings, there was 20 that were clear and bright. And, and I filmed all of those mornings. So, so what I would do was, I would go there and, uh, and set up my camera and, uh, and spend a few hours around there. Uh, I suppose my point was, or what I was trying to do really was um, to make some kind of meditation on the passing of time. I was very keenly aware of the fact that I had this opportunity to commemorate somebody who um, had played such a critical role in our history at such a vital time. Uh, but I was also interested in uh, a meditation on the passing of time. And I think that, you know, as human beings, uh, and particularly as Irish people, um, we, we measure the absence of, of people that we love uh, and that are gone in blocks of time, starting with, you know, the month's mind after somebody passes through to the first anniversary and so on and so forth. But there comes a point where obviously that starts to fade. Uh, and, and for most of us, that will fade out uh, and be forgotten. But for a man uh, like Frank Lawless, um, it wasn't going to be the case. And, and particularly at, at such a significant uh, um, uh, point uh, as a centenary, uh, there was a great opportunity to commemorate him. Um, so um, I would spend time um, there uh, every morning. Um, if some of you may know where the, where the cemetery is, it's a very busy place uh, on a very busy junction. Um, and uh, the sun would come up, I'd, I'd, I'd be filming, and after that, there would be a lot of traffic for a few hours. And then after that, I started to discover that once the schools opened, um, or sorry, once the schools opened and, and rush hour died down, that the whole place started to get very quiet indeed. And, uh, and so I started to bring my bike. And the thing I used to do was once I stopped filming, I would take my bike and go for a cycle um, around the place. So I, I went to Tones Hill, um, where he, he met his very untimely end. Rathbeal Road, uh, went around Saucerstown, where the family farm was. And, and generally, you know, it wasn't an opportunity, or there wasn't an opportunity to walk in his shoes, but I felt that I could um, cycle in his bike tracks. And I, I really wanted to get a sense of place, uh, because I think uh, from listening to Bernard speak, um, his politics were very much based 
on, on that pride of place that he had. And uh, so I really wanted to kind of honor that as well. <clears throat> I think one of the things that was really struck me immediately uh, was obviously that somebody uh, with, uh, of such a valiant person and, and somebody who, who had, had literally laid down his life could have his life taken away in such a sudden and innocuous way. And, uh, and I think one of the things that really struck me too was that um, just the private grief that was kind of hidden from the public story. Um, because, you know, in this photograph, uh, we don't see any members of the family. But clearly, uh, I mean, in my own case, um, I, I come from a large family as well, and our dad died when we were really young. So it was kind of a personal inspiration because I felt that um, behind this public story is a really intense story, a very private grief. One of the things I discovered uh, while I was researching was the fact that, um, you know, uh, the story of the aftermath would make a really good film as well. And I think Bernard touched upon that there and what he was chatting about, that, you know, what happened to the family afterwards. But obviously, I wasn't in a position to make a film like that. So. Um, one of the things I tried to do as well was uh, put some kind of music in, in a kind of to honor him in a commemorative way. Uh, and one of the uh, initially that was uh, I uh, filmed at Ilan Piper at the graveside, uh, but that didn't quite work. So um, I went back and brought a Shano singer called Ethna Neil Cahan. You'll see it in the film in a little while. Um, and then just again, a kind of in a symbolic way. Um, the, the, the song that she sings, I'm Drying On Down, was definitely sung in 1922, a beautiful lament. Uh, but I took that and then I gave it to um, an electronic music artist and made a kind of a remix of that to kind of have a symbolic uh, version, 2022 version. And that's the piece of music um, that ends the program. Um, oh, sorry, that ends the film. Um, so that, they were the kind of the, the two uh, key things a sense of time and a meditation on that, and also like, you know, to get across that sense of place. Um, so with that, I might just show you the film. Mocking any attempt to capture time, let alone mark an exact century's measure of it, another spring morning breaks on this North County Dublin hinterland, a terrain which bids a swift farewell to the city with a majestic sweep of open country, dazzling in all directions under the rising sun. As the morning steals upon the night, the creep of the city stops and the beauty of this rich pasture land is laid bare in the sweet embrace of one more unassailable dawn. The invincibility of that first light and the secrets held in its shadows are what brings me here. My name is Donald Neen, and I have made this journey time and again in this year of 2022 to steal a march on the dawning and make my way to the tiny circular cemetery which rests atop the ruins of an ancient church in Rollstown. I come here with my camera to give some time back to a moment of great significance that was captured here on photographic film exactly 100 years ago before imprinting itself into the history books and onto the consciousness of a nation. Here lies patriot, politician, husband, farmer, father and freedom fighter Frank Lawless. This is his headstone and final resting place, but for reasons I will explain, his deeds are his monument. Of course, a hundred years in the life of these ancient trees here at Rollstone isn't all that much. And in fact, it's but a flicker in the expanse of existence of the land that sustains them, and not even that in the great span of time that shapes the fall of this Fingalian ground into the rolling vista we see before us. So time in its broadest sense is an ephemeral force which flies over us, leaving only shadows in its wake. This isn't a tale too slow for the impatience of our age, but rather one that speaks with some clarity to our vulnerability and ultimate impermanence, now and always. Born into a staunchly nationalist family at nearby Saucerstown, Frank Lawless became politically active in the movement from a young age, and his membership of organisations like the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the GAA and Gaelic League, were precursors to the key role he played as a member of the Irish Volunteers in the Easter Rising of 1916. 
The love he harboured for his country was matched in intensity by the strength of his belief in the cause of Irish liberty, and his heroic stand at the nearby Battle of Ashburn was a measure of that commitment. The death sentence, subsequently handed down, was initially commuted to 10 years penal servitude before being rescinded entirely in June 1917 upon the general amnesty called by Prime Minister Lloyd George. Internment was no deterrent to his Republican resolve, however. Having won a seat for Dublin County North in the 1918 general election, he was absent from the inaugural meeting of the first Dáil, but his political energy continued unabated. Now, I am not a historian, and accurate impressions of who Frank Lawless was have long since been creased and crumpled into the folds of history books. But there are still ways and means of getting a sense of both the man and his domain, which is where my bicycle comes in, or wheels out, perhaps. There are well over 2 million operational in 2022, but in 1922, there were but a few thousand cars on the roads of Ireland. What peace! Not just for Frank Lawless, but for every Irish person. This was the era when pedal power was the most effective engine and the bicycle king. Pretty much everything else has changed, but the distance from A to B remains steadfastly the same, as does the feel of the temperate breeze between the trees and the fall of that same ground on either flank. Just like today, there was no shortage of things to look at and admire in 1922 through the eyes of a farmer like Frank Lawless. The foundations of his beliefs were rooted in pride of place, and looking around, you can see why. With the explosion of life in the first blush of spring, it's a lot to take in. I take to the asphalt for another reason too. Having laid down his life and escaped a death sentence, Frank Lawless met a sudden and innocuous end here on these same roads. On April 16th, 1922, a pony and trap in which Frank and his son Colin were travelling in was involved in an accident in which the horse took fright and the vehicle overturned. He died that same evening in Pembroke Private Hospital without ever regaining consciousness. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. The timing of his passing was at a defining moment in Irish history. Due to the frequency of his internment, Frank Lawless was mostly absent from the War of Independence, but his re-election to the second Dáil in May 1921 meant he was front and centre of the debate on the Anglo-Irish Treaty as the calendar turned to 1922. After nine full days of debate in the chamber, the treaty was ratified by 64 votes to 57 on January 7th, with Frank Lawless voting in favour of it, remaining in his seat as Eamon de Valera and others walked out in protest. Arthur Griffith was elected president and the split which led to civil war became real. The volatility of those long days and weeks in between in Ireland caused the shattering of bonds and the opening of wounds which would take decades to heal and forever for historians to unpick and unpack. But destiny had other plans for Frank Lawless, and while the pressure bore heavily upon him throughout those fateful days, he wouldn't live to see the horrors of the bloodshed to come. After a funeral with full military honours in the pro-cathedral, the cemetery at Rollstown was designated his final resting place. The long list of dignitaries at the graveside was remarkable, given the political and military context at the time. By the time of the funeral, the lines of the treaty split were entrenched, and the burial in Rollstown was the last time the pre-split leadership stood together. Michael Collins was there, as was Eamon de Valera, who stood face to face with Arthur Griffith beneath the Celtic cross marking the lawless family plot. With the country on tenter hooks, the suspension of animosity to mourn a fallen leader was a symbolic moment of great import. Considering the hellish noise and clamour imminent civil war would bring, the silence of the photograph is pregnant with consequence. What we are looking at here is a direct glimpse into the eye of the hurricane. So I've been returning to this spot on a daily basis with my camera as the centenary approaches. Like all sacred places with bones in the ground, echoes of the near and ancient past mingle with the birdsong in the thin air. On some mornings, in a certain kind of light, it feels like slipping through the veil between worlds wouldn't take all that much. 
That's when I hear the sound of Ethna Cahoyne singing and drain on down and drift away. What the gravesite photograph doesn't show is the whole other side of the tragedy. The faces of Frank Lawless's widow Catherine and their ten children are all absent from the frame. His struggle was over before its time, but theirs had only really just begun. A moment of deep political significance was recorded and frozen in time, but no camera could ever capture the magnitude of their loss. Unphotographable grief is another thing which remains the same in 19 or 2022. And cemeteries are containers for those rawest of feelings in the whole of the felt world. Here, our souls are laid bare as well as to rest. But for every sunset, there's a sunrise. And in the first glow of a new morning, that veil is sometimes broken and the shadows dance again, bridging the gap between light and dark, night and day, and the living and the dead. Thank you. 